Joining us now for our international news review is the one, the only Anita Kapoor, the moderator, host, and mindfulness guy. Great to have you with us today, Anita. So good to see you guys. I feel uh, a little bit lost, though, because I do not have Money FM stuck on my wall behind me. <laughs> well, well, maybe we can send something Anita, over. Anita, there is so much Money <laughs> FM around us. I dream Money <laughs> FM. <laughs> I wake up screaming Money not, FM. Not always a dream, I might add. Yeah, not, always a dream. not always a pleasant dream, but anyway. Um, Anita, thank evil. you. You're you're filling in today for Steve Oaken, who is uh, traveling in the U.S., and we, we do appreciate it. Let's jump right in uh, to one of our big stories, which was uh, the United Nations was voting to suspend Russia as a member of their Human Rights Council, and, um, and Singapore decided to abstain from that vote. Uh, what do we know about this story? Because it's been across the newspapers uh, for yesterday and today. I just want to say, filling in for Steve Oaken, hello, guys. Uh, those are really big shoes to fill. So this is really just <laughs> my take on it. I mean, um, I think for most people, it was a surprising decision to abstain, considering how I think Singapore has, I think from day one, condemned the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But they are also co-sponsor of the Resolution 491, if I've read it correctly, and which that resolution actually mandated the Commission of Inquiry. So it's not really that much of a surprise. It's quite a prudent step. Uh, what I found was, you know, I know this is a very, very sensitive topic, but I thought it was really childish in that sense. You know, Russia was suspended and then they left. You know, mm, so yeah. the questions that came to my mind were, okay, uh, and Tanjo Fee actually, uh, she did take to the, sta to the stage and explain why Singapore had abstained. She's a Singapore's deputy permanent representative of the UN. She said, there must be accountability for any gross and systematic human rights violations that have taken place in the conflict in Ukraine, and we urge all parties to cooperate with the Commission's work. So the first thing I asked myself, though, is a couple of things. How and when does an inquiry take place? in a situation that Russia and Ukraine are in at this moment. We've seen a lot of the photographs. They are horrible. Um, they're extremely disturbing. That's what's coming up. When does this actually happen and how can it happen? Uh, the other question I want to ask is that they've been suspended and they've left. So does then the commission actually have any power to conduct um, any, any inquiry in the country in, yeah. in, in itself? Good question. So, Yep. You know, because uh, I, I thought, well, okay, they've kind of taken back the power because they suspended, but they didn't stay in suspension and they've actually left. So yep. right. I do think that it's a very prudent decision on the part of Singapore. The activist in me is like, you know, no, <laughs> but at the same time, I think um, running a, a commission of inquiry quickly uh, is very, very useful, but can it be done in the midst of a war is my other yeah. And that's the key point, isn't it, Anita, that you mentioned there? You know, we need an inquiry. What is it going to take? Glenn and I attended a fascinating, albeit rather depressing, uh, panel discussion this week with the Ukrainian ambassador, the Estonian ambassador, and a Ukrainian lawyer activist who has recently returned from the border doing extraordinary humanitarian work and glenn actually asked a very interesting question about the red line what is the line that needs to be crossed at this point to need some sort of decisive action as i'm seeing now that train station attack that happened overnight in kramatorsk the death toll has now risen to over 50 yeah. um, there are children amongst the victims it says five children is the latest news now this train station was a civilian train station and there were civilians there, up to 4,000 at the time. The death toll has now surpassed 50. That's the question, isn't it, Anita? At what point does a red line, where is that red line? Where does it have to be crossed before we go to the next step? Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, the problem we're also facing is that we're living in social media times. On one hand, we are seeing as much as we could possibly see almost to the point of overwhelm. At the same time, believe me when I tell you, and I spend a fair bit of time on social media, there are actually people writing comments that say that this is a setup, you know, that yeah. this couldn't possibly have happened. And I'm thinking, okay, where are you living in this world? And that's why I think as well what you're saying is we have to decide who decides where is the red line and when do we actually say, okay, enough is enough, and who gets to be a part of the decisions that are made. Well, it it is a um, yeah. It's it's not an, an issue that we can solve here, and we all know that that 
if a response comes from other countries, whether it's NATO or surrounding countries uh, against Russia, uh, you know, that very well could be the beginning of what everyone is saying uh, would be World War III, right, uh, in that part of the world. So there is, uh, and that's not to say that it's not worth the fight at this moment when you see the horrific conditions that have been put upon Ukrainians, uh, but it is something that, you know, countries need to uh, reckon with if they are going to take that step. All right. Okay. Uh, I just say one more yeah, thing. Sure. No, I just want to have the last word, don't I? No. Uh, no, it's just that I think that what we're looking at is we're looking at war through the lens, through, through many layers of different lenses, and it is actually almost an impossible task for everyone to kind of come to terms because things are happening so quickly, we're seeing it in so many different ways, and that therein lies, and it's the same thing that you can apply to, to anything that shocks our nervous system. Sometimes we actually have no idea how to respond, and other times we're like full for it. But you're right, there has to be a limit. There has to be, because people are dying, and we are seeing them die, <laughs> literally yeah, yeah. in real time. And sadly, I think it'll be, as Glenn and I have discussed on this show, when it hits our wallets. And it's going to hit all of our wallets, wallets very soon because of the food security crisis that is on the horizon yeah. with regards to oil, energy, and food stocks like sunflower oil and wheat. And, fer from, and fertilizer. And fertilizer, yeah. which comes from Ukraine and Russia. It's on the horizon. It's going to affect us all. Absolutely. And I think that this is the, this is the issue, really. Um, if we would take away what the powers that be are supposed to do, what do we as human beings get actually afraid of? What are we really afraid of? We saw it with COVID as well, right? I mean, we're buying 100 rolls of toilet paper because we are so afraid that we're not going to have any. Now what happens if there isn't any? And it's yeah. not just there. It's also happening through China. We get so much of our produce coming through China. I know we want to talk about China as well, but I think we have to really look at it and I know that during COVID time, Singapore and um, ASEAN had signed a particular agreement, which was a trade agreement of some sort. And I'm hoping that that is going to be helpful, but that's a story for another time. But uh, yeah. that's exactly it. Europe is going to be hit big. So, mm. Let, let's let's do move on because uh, we got uh, at least one more story that we need to cover, which is what's happening in China with COVID. Uh, Shanghai has seemed to be sort of an epicenter for a lot uh, going on, a lot of protests happening now because of the harsh uh, and lockdown that's been happening there. Another sidelight to this is the port in Shanghai, which is, uh, e you know, either the busiest or second compared to Singapore. Uh, it is now clogging all the supply chains because the port is shut down due to the workers not being able to go. And, and Beijing has so far refused to come away from its zero COVID policy, which is just making these uh, challenges even worse. Wh what, do, what does this look like uh, other than a big mess? Uh, the words that came to my mind was risk aversion gone wrong. Because I think having a zero COVID policy, we all know now, does not work. Absolutely not. And certainly not 26 million people and so forth. I mean, it just is not going to happen. And I think this, this, the resolution that they have made to continue to try to have the zero COVID policy is extremely harmful to the people in China themselves, to this city, and to anybody around. Um, so for me, I, I just wonder what is honestly going on behind the scenes when I see other countries sort of playing catch up to where most of the other countries have already been. Um, you know, it's a very simple thing that I ask myself, do not countries speak to one another on what works and what doesn't for a COVID policy? I mean, at the end of the day, why is it so complex? The entire world has experienced COVID. I think we have enough case studies. So that's on one side. And then on the other side, you know, um, yeah, we're all going to feel the pinch, right? Uh, if if supplies aren't coming in, now what? You know, what are we right. going to do? And Absolutely. at the same time, I also look at it like this. We have these issues and problems that are going to happen. It's a very domino effect. As human beings living in the countries that we do, where we have a certain level of privilege as well, how are we going to change it and how are our countries going to change it? How are we going to be informed how to sort of pull back or hold back in the way that we have done it before, for example, when we had um, less rainfall. Simple situation, less rainfall, use less water. So if this is coming, I think we need to be well informed ahead of time and people need to understand and there needs to be something done to keep us as human beings kind of in our lane. 
Yeah, mm. I think you make a great point. I think it comes back to what I said just now. It's about money again. Shanghai is the world's number one container port. So it literally runs a sp it's a spine that runs through global supply chains. It is going to have an effect on us at some point, Glenn. It will hit home globally fairly yeah. soon. And it just says more broadly, Anita, bringing it back to COVID, that, as you mentioned, the zero COVID doesn't work. And it just shows you the tightrope that Singapore, for example, has to walk every day in its COVID management. Even in something as simple as masks, do you wear them, do you not wear them? It's an ongoing tightrope for all of us, isn't it? It absolutely is. You know, and I love my country and I'd be the first one to, to comment on any policy that affects me as well, right? Um, but I have felt that <clears throat> this latest way in which we've actually managed to open up parts of our, I mean, we've opened up all of our industries, but we've also allowed ourselves to wear our masks outside, but not inside. I think this is a prudency that I can actually stand behind, because it makes sense. It allows things to actually move on a little bit. But the worst is not over, because what, what we're doing in our country is one thing, and as we're talking about today, what's happening around us is going to impact us, and I think we need to be a bit ready for that. Yeah. Anita, real quickly, uh, we have private astronauts, uh, the first full team of private astronauts lifting off uh, for the International Space Station. This is a, uh, a watershed moment in space travel. Tell us about it. Come on, Glenn. Why are you asking me this? Why are you asking me this? You know I'm going to say, but why? Thank but you. why? Thank you. Thank you. But, but why what? Who cares? What is what it do you doing? Who cares? Do you know how much has come from the space, from space exploration and space industry over the past 60 Glenn, years? Glenn, yes, come on. Point? GPS, Velcro, I mean, carry on, right? Yeah, that was 50 years ago. No, 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 but it's, it, it's continuing though, right? This is important. No, is this? I think that actually, again, it comes down to this. I'm all for how do we behave as human beings in time of crisis? How do we behave as human beings after crisis? And I think that space discovery space, walk space, whatever, it's always been, it always has felt like a feel-good moment and a distraction from what is really at stake. And I find that these private crews going up, right, okay, so, so what is it doing for me as a person? And hello, what's going on on the ground? Yeah, no, I agree. I, Glenn and I have had many a heated discussion about this one. Just to recap for our listeners, a SpaceX rocket ship was due to lift off well, last night, any time now, our time, uh, four men approved by NASA to become the first all-private astronaut team. And, of course, they're not daft. They have to say it's going to be in the interests of science and STEM and development and all of that. And I, I don't doubt for a second that there will be an element of this. SpaceX is privately funded, of course, by billionaire Elon Musk. I don't doubt there'll be an element of that. But also, what is it ultimately about? It's about rich people going to space. No, no, no. These aren't space tourists. These are scientists. Yeah, but still. Yeah, these, are, these are scientists. But the, the point is this being funded privately, not being funded by governments. Yeah. And, and we all know governments don't have money anymore to do this. Correct. So these aren't space tourists. These are guys that are actually going to the space station to get stuff done. So I think there is a difference there. I mean, I, I think we're largely in agreement about the space tourism thing. I mean, who cares? Honestly, I don't care about that. But I do care about advancing science. Well, hang, on, hang on. Is this really yep. advancing science or is this really about the next frontier? Because we've already conquered the Earth. Maybe it's both. We've made a mess, we've made a mess of it. And I've been reading so much about, you know, the, the fact that now we want to also conquer space. We also want to conquer other planets. And I think that there's something not quite right with this. And, and at the end of the day, true, let's find out what is the intention behind this? Why do we need this? What is it going to do for humanity? And also the timing of it just feels a little bit, uh, you know, it's a little bit skewed. And I think part of the reason why these things are timed the way they are, and this is the conspiracy theorist of me, but I don't care, uh, is that it actually is a feel-good thing. You know, there's a no, lot no, of No, no, but these things, these things are planned years in advance, right? This yeah, isn't, this isn't just something that came up you know, last year or last month, right? This would have been many, many, many years in advance. Look at what we're focused on. Right. We're focused on really actually currently a war. We're focused on the fact that the, the cleanup after COVID. And so these guys are going to space to advance research. Hmm. Like, yeah. for me, it doesn't, it doesn't feel quite right. Yeah. Never mind what they're going to do, but the timing for me just does not feel. Yeah, I, I try and see both sides. They're arguing the AX1 team that they're going to conduct more than two dozen science experiments aboard the ISS, including research on brain health, 
cardiac stem cells, cancer and aging, as well as various tech demonstrations on microgravity. I get that. I also get Anita's point completely. We've had many arguments on this show, Anita, believe me, about this subject. Um, I do feel completely there's ego involved. Um, I do feel they just want to conquer the last final frontier. I do think they all think they're Captain Kirk. And uh, I'm much more interested in the likes of Bill Gates spending his billions here on the earth to trying to deal with climate change, poverty, deforestation, and the issues that I think here are a lot more important than well, what's going on up there. Sure. But look beyond the headline. Look, look at the long-term value of stuff like this. And it is always a long-term play. It doesn't, we won't see the benefits tomorrow. But climate change is now. Deforestation yeah, yeah. is now. I think That's what true. we actually but a lot of other people are working on those things too, right? No, yeah, yeah. Nothing happens in isolation. Hey, they can spend their money on what yeah. they like. Yeah, it's exactly. their money. Yeah. But. I don't think what we actually really need is we need, need a little less phallicness in this world. <laughs> we do. That's Come on. Good good. Good. Anita Kapoor, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you on that one, Anita. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Neil. All Thank right. You. Hey, on, on that fine note we do have to say goodbye we're bumping up at the top of the hour anita kapoor thank you so much for being with us today uh moderator host mindfulness guide always great to have you on india thanks for your time thanks for having me guys